I pulled the difficult gig again. David had the session straight after lunch and I had the uh, session straight after afternoon tea. And I'm in the way of you listening to Sean Gregory about what he's doing at Woodside. And then you're getting out to pausey and you go, great, another vendor presentation. Just really what I wanted to do straight after afternoon tea. My name's Chris Clarkson. I work for Huawei, okay? Now, my apologies to any native Mandarin speakers in the room because the full extent of my Mandarin is Ni Hao and She She, okay? But just to clear up the pronunciation of the name, it's Huawei, okay? I get Who Are We a lot, okay? Which is, uh, is not the way that uh, the company's name is pronounced. So what I'd just like to do is just briefly give you an overview of Huawei in the first instance. Douglas Adams, of course, said space is big, really, really big. Huawei is big, really, really big. We operate in 170 countries. There are about 179,000 employees. Our 2016 revenue was 75 billion US dollars. In the fourth quarter of last year, we had the third highest by volume shipment of servers in the world. We've gone from none to three to 16 to 19 entries in the top 500. Uh, there are 79,000 R&D engineers based in 16 R&D facilities and 36 joint innovation centers ac across the world. We have a complete range of HPC systems. And you may not be aware that we have a uh, fabulous semiconductor business called High Silicon. So we're also doing chip level innovations as well in terms of uh, NICs, SSD controllers, management chips as well that go inside uh, our hardware. Just some of the reference locations that uh, Huawei have in the HPC environment. You might be aware that we recently picked up the Graham cluster for Compute Canada, which is now Huawei's largest machine. It's a little bit over uh, two petaflops at the uh, University of Waterloo. Uh, I will touch on briefly some work that we've been doing with uh, Stanford University in the large memory area. There are a series of German automobile manufacturers. Okay, oops, I pressed the wrong button. I meant to press the one that one, German automobile manufacturers, which I cannot name. <laughs> that we do work. And I will also be talking today about what we're doing with CERN. Interesting that my colleagues at Bios IT are all also working at CERN uh, on HPC and cloud technology. So essentially it's a talk in two parts. It's a football game in four quarters. Um, I will talk about advancing HPC today and about evolving the HPC landscape and Huawei's view on where things are going. There are three main pillars that we focus on inside Huawei from an HPC perspective. The first pillar is maximising efficiency. Okay, so more compute in less space at lower power consumption end-to-end -end energy efficiency design, okay? Adapting to emerging power distribution and cooling technologies and tightly integrating with Huawei's data center infrastructure. As some of you who may be aware, quick show of hands in the room, who uses Vodafone or Optus for their mobile phones? Okay, about a third of you. Your phone is talking to Huawei equipment. Okay, Huawei's radio, uh, Huawei's radio area network is the radio area network that underpins the Optus uh, commitment uh, in terms of the ability for mobile phones to operate in Australia. We have been doing telco of one form or another for 30 years. So we have experience in working in DC environments which a lot of other vendors can't bring to bear because they don't come back from a uh, telecommun equipment, telecommunications equipment vendor experience base. So um, I'll touch on briefly some of the things that we're doing in this area here. Secondly, we're all about accelerating your workload. 
We are looking to maximise the performance of individual workloads by providing a fle flexible modular architecture that suits particular uh, environments. And I'll talk about that and some of the innovative form factors that we have in a little bit as well. And lastly, we're adapting to change. We're speeding the adoption of new hardware technologies. We're looking at how one can multi-purpose HPC systems and we're looking at leverage, leveraging cloud. And I'll talk specifically today about what we're doing in cloud, in big data, and to use that much hackneyed term, artificial intelligence. So Huawei's philosophy here is the same philosophy it applies across its entire pr product range, whether it be mobile phones, telecommunications equipment, or enterprise uh, information technology. So we have capability to deliver solutions that use high voltage DC or 48 volt DC to provide better efficiency in terms of PUE for the data center. We look to right size the power form factor and importantly manage power from the chip level to the box level, to the rack level, to the room level. I'm assured that noise is not actually the air conditioner. In fact, the wind bellowing up against this back wall here, which is a little bit distressing, but let us not dwell on that any further. Okay, in terms of cooling, we have solutions that incorporate free air cooling, running at high ambient temperatures. Now again, telecommunications equipment winds up in some strange and particularly inhospitable places. We have network switches that will run to 70 degrees C, okay? We have servers that will run to 45 degrees C. And we are taking that technology and applying that in, the, in a liquid cooling environment to both warm and hot water cooling that does not require chillers, okay? Providing uh, solutions that are cost effective. And in terms of the actual data center inf infrastructure, you may not be aware that Huawei do containerized data centers and they're used quite extensively here in Western Australia in the mining industry, okay? And modular data centers. The containerized data centers that are here in Western Australia in the mining industry, I should point that out, are not containing high performance computers, they're just containing IT equipment out on mine sites, etc. Okay? And in terms of acceleration, we have solutions in the flash space, in in-memory computing, and with a range of hardware acceleration, including GPU, FPGA, <coughs> and Knight's Landing. All right. A little bit about the Huawei liquid cooling system. It's compatible with, uh, with third-party racks up to 52 RU. We, have, uh, we can put in 36 RU, 96 nodes, or 128 nodes in 48 RU. So we can achieve some fairly impressive densities compared to uh, our competitors in this field. But the CPU and the memory are cooled directly by up to 45 degree water. The idea being there that you can dispense with the chiller entirely, that it's optional, and still achieve a PUE of less than 1.1. You look incredulous, Renee. <laughs> so there you go. And it has in industry leading serviceability. So we first started doing liquid cooling with the Poznan Supercomputing Center in Poland and have since uh, developed that technology further from when we first deployed uh, that system a couple of years back. That's still our second highest rate of system on the, uh, on the top 500, uh, but the uh, system that we're deploying for Compute Canada now outranks that. Um, so I mentioned that we have different form factors to suit different workloads. So the fundamental underpinning of one of our uh, solution sets is the Fusion Server E9000. You see we have ultra high density nodes like the ones that I described just pre previously in the, uh, in the liquid cooling area. Hardware accelerator nodes that will take um, uh, NVIDIA uh, GPUs, a standard compute node that we would, uh, that uh, uh, as of several weeks back will now take Skylake, a big data storage node which uh, has a large number of uh, 
uh, drives inside the storage node and large memory bandwidth node. And the alternative approach is to use, again, a somewhat differently designed um, bladed uh, device, the Fusion Server X6800, which again also has a hardware accelerated node, a standard compute node, and a big data storage node. But instead of having uh, long, thin nodes, we have sort of s almost squarish type nodes in that particular environment. And, uh, and different users find their workloads work better in different environments. So curiously enough, the, the nodes provided to the German automobile manufacturers are this type, okay, and similarly Compute Canada have opted to that. You might be aware that uh, last Christmas uh, we were successful in securing the University of Tasmania's uh, HPC upgrade and they've opted for this particular system with a standard compute node for their particular solution. Okay, all our servers provide NVMe in them, okay, across the entire range at different densities. Okay, so there is not a system in our portfolio in the HPC environment that does not have the Taishan E3000 V3 in it. And while we don't make the flash chips, we do make the flash controller again in that fabulous uh, semiconductor company High Silicon, a Huawei subsidiary, that's where the smarts of those are. And for those of you who already researched late last year, you may have recollected I had on the stand a, uh, an SSD that's uh, um, 32 terabytes. We would expect to see that coming out this year, okay, um, in the standard form factor. In terms of big memory compute, there are two main platforms. It's funny, some of you might know the vendor that I used to work for and they used to say, we have the only 32 socket big memory platform and then I arrived at, uh, at uh, Huawei and they said, we have the only two, uh, 32 socket big memory platform and I went, you know what, you're both wrong, okay, because they both have one, okay. Huawei had the Kunlun, and if you wonder where the name Kunlun is, comes from, it's the name of the highest mountain in China. Okay, so uh, that will um, have up to uh, 32 terabytes of, uh, can put up to 32 terabytes of RAM in it. And uh, I note that unfortunately John isn't here because one of his competitor universities have one of those. Uh, we've been doing some work at Stanford University around this particular box on Snap VX. Anybody in the room come across Snap VX? No, I'll be, I'll be teaching you something new today, which is uh, refreshing in a vendor session, isn't it? So Snap VX is an open source Python uh, optimization solver based on something called alternating direction methods of multipliers. I don't pretend to understand the maths personally, but it is graph based and AD, ADMM uh, splits the problem up into a series of parallelizable sub-problems and it allows you to solve particularly large problems. Okay, uh, a case study would be house price prediction. Okay, so for a set of houses with given features, latitude, longitude, number of bedrooms, square footage, etc., the goal is to build a model to predict the sales price of any particular house. But there are other common applications, control systems, consensus and exchange problems, pager rank, information diffusion, regularization, fixed routing, network inference, etc. So the actual code, um, you can see the URL here down the bottom, but blue on blue doesn't work particularly well. But given that you'll have the slides available, you'll be able to find it there. Uh, it was actually developed at Stanford, okay, and um, the, they make use of one of our um, uh, RH8100s, uh, which uh, they put 12 terabytes of uh, RAM into. And uh, the workload characteristics of Snap VX relies on short, frequent messages with very large communication overhead. So the subprocessors complete simple tasks, broadcast the results, and then they repeat that all again with new data. So of course, 
if you have a large memory footprint machine, you can load the entire problem into shared memory, parallelize it across the different CPUs, and eliminate the, eliminate the message passing overhead. So the, uh, the quote here is from Stanford, Huawei's large memory uh, machines allows to solve optimization problems with hundreds of millions of unknowns in just minutes. Right. So let me talk a little bit about evolving um, the HPC landscape. And I'm going to focus in three particular areas where Huawei is uh, making innovation. I'm going to talk about enabling the HPC cloud. The major telco provider in Germany is Deutsche Telekom. It has an integration arm called T-Systems. And we do a lot of work with T-Systems in Germany on what's called the Open Telecom Cloud, and no, that's not a selling, spelling mistake, that is the, uh, the German of it. And uh, the cloud is an HPC class cloud. It's built with an InfiniBand fabric, it has hardware accelerators in it, and it also has bare metal compute in it. And we spend a lot of time advancing the cloud software stack in terms of HPC class storage, support importantly for containers, and having exactly the same stack for both on-prem private clouds okay, and for the public cloud that T-Systems makes available. Okay. Big data ac acceleration. Um, so we've already met, uh, looked at uh, the large memory compute node when we looked at the Kunlun and the RH8100. Uh, new storage class memory uh, and importantly both FPGAs and custom accelerators. And we're w working closely with Intel in the FPGA area. Okay? We're also advancing big data software, especially for those with large amounts of streaming data that need millisecond latency. And lastly, uh, in terms of leveraging artificial intelligence, we're looking at business dream, uh, business driven innovation um, to help them uh, or help customers work on uh, on new business problems and create uses uh, that are new technology with IA and partner with industry leading organisations in rela in relation to that. So let me just talk briefly about what we're doing with cloud. Probably the best reference case I can bring together here is ironically CERN, okay, which we do in conjunction with. T systems. Okay, so again, a quote from CERN here. Uh, we, the Open Telecom Cloud is the Huawei HPC class public cloud hosted by T systems that uh, CERN do their high energy quantum collision research on. Okay, um, the performance compared with common cloud hosts that are available from other vendors. It's about a 30% uh, performance improvement. Okay. And in terms of being, uh, being able to bring it to bear, they took it from uh, a 90-day uh, time to market that they were getting with traditional cloud vendors to bringing it down to 15 days when working with the combination of T-Systems and Huawei. And overall, this reduced CERN's maintenance costs by 67% compared to the large investment that they had in on-prem cloud that they were previously uh, making use of. So we see HPC cloud for both research and enterprise. And we at Huawei are a great believer in what we call industry cloud, okay? which is a cloud that caters to a particular vertical. And the three that we have been putting our most effort into in this space are a design emulation cloud where we are collaborate, uh, collaborating with ESI. Okay? Uh, and I know that the Pawsey Centre have been using ESI for open foam training, for example. Okay? So we have co-developed with ESI a design emulation cloud, public cloud service that, that is acceptable, that is accessible, what I was trying to say, not acceptable, okay, accessible um, to those people who are looking to collaborate on a public cloud flat platform in that space. Okay, we equally have also uh, done this with Altair as well, with the Altair suite of products, uh, and where also 
uh, it's being driven uh, by the manufacturing industries. Okay, um, and we have also got some focus in the energy area. And energy inside Huawei is a broad church that encompasses both utilities and the extractive industries, oil and gas mining. Okay, so it's very broad term energy. Uh, and these clouds that we have been developing with partners like ESI, Altair, T-Systems for CERN, okay, and the, uh, the Helix Nebula cloud, if you can't make that out, that's Helix Nebula, which also uh, supports the CERN environment. Um, we have NVIDIA P100 GPU acceleration in it, FPGA acceleration in it. It's using the types of networking that we are familiar with in high performance computing environment, that the virtual machines have very high specifications in it. Uh, for example, VMs that have 128 virtual CPUs in it and four terabytes worth of RAM. Okay, but additionally, we have a traditional bare metal service in there for those codes that simply need that sort of service in order to be able to operate. Now in the big data area, I'm going to just touch quickly on three different use cases. One um, uh, looking at Hadoop, another one looking at Spark, and another one looking at Storm. And again, this is about hardware acceleration of these software environments. Uh, one looks at uh, what we might be doing in terms of hardware acceleration of HDFS. The other one looks at uh, using in, uh, uh, NVMe SSDs to accelerate Spark. And the last one looks at using RDMA to accelerate stor uh, Storm. So an example here is HDFS compression for Hadoop. Okay, by using a hardware GZIP compression uh, device that is Huawei developed. And you might not be able to pick up the Huawei logo on that just there. Okay. Um, HDFS compression means that uh, for the, exactly the same Hadoop job, okay, CPU, util CPU utilization is reduced by 30% and storage capacity is improved by 43%. Okay. So naturally that's occurred because of the that, uh, CPU resource has been um, uh, released. There's native software support here and it's 100% transparent to the application software. Okay, uh, I mentioned the fact that uh, Huawei um, have the uh, a fabulous um, high silicon uh, microprocessor development environment and I mentioned the fact that we have our own NVMe SSDs and in this particular instance we're using a combination of a memory and SSD hybrid intelligent cache to accelerate Spark. Okay, so during, and you'll excuse me, I know I am now talking terms that I am personally not familiar with because I'm not personally familiar with Spark. So uh, it's during shuffle to disk, shuffle read, uh, they, re uh, they require intensive random reads of small data blocks and essentially uh, high bandwidth uh, NVMe SSD uh, assists with that particular use case. Uh, so essentially what that does is it means that the analysis time in these case studies is reduced and that the overall performance is, re uh, uh, is increased and this boosts performance by essentially replacing traditional spinning disk with SSDs. Again, 100% transparent to application software and the Huawei SSD supports a highly reliable built-in atomic write because of course we're doing the, uh, the controller inside the SSD which gives us a differentiator compared to other SSD uh, manufacturers. Okay, now uh, throw this one to the audience. When, uh, ROCE, do people say Rocky or Rochi? I've heard both. Rocky, okay, uh, obviously the person who has said Rot Rochi might have, must have been in a and uh, somebody from uh, Southern Europe, I'm guessing, and they were looking for, uh, uh, thinking of, uh, think of it in that way. I, I've always said Rocky until I heard Rochi and then I wasn't sure. Okay, all right, so this is an example of uh, a stream processing uh, acceleration uh, using, um, using Rocky. Uh, so the example there is without RDMA, 
Uh, the storm uh, uh, environment that we're looking at had a CPU utilisation of about 53% by offloading with RDMA. Okay, we were able to bring the CPU utilisation up to uh, 88%. So we redirect the TB, uh, TCP IP streams to uh, Rocky version 2 with a smart NIC, uh, uh, which increases the uh, throughput by 20% and reduces the late latency, uh, sorry, the throughput by 50% and the latency by 20%. Lastly, in the area of AI, you, when people think of Huawei, we do talk a lot about smart city, safe city. Okay, and you know these days there are environments which are literally flooded with CCTV cameras. Okay, uh, of course the uh, the benefit to this only comes when one can do real time video analysis. So we have a whole class of machines that will take the input from literally thousands of CCTV cameras, and in conjunction with uh, uh, stock standard NVIDIA GPUs will allow us to do real-time video and uh, intelligent analysis and then in the back end create a video big data lake which we can then leverage for, uh, for analysis after the fact. So when we think about this particular environment, these environments in terms of traditional HPC, big data, and artificial intelligence, we at Huawei see an evolving system design. We're at the wonderful, in my opinion, uh, wonderful point where we're virtually at a Cambrian explosion of choices in the HPC environment. And that's not my line. I think I read it on Next Platform. Okay, uh, where essentially we used to have the choice of one vendor in the CPU space. We had the choice of one type of memory, okay, and we had a cho uh, choice of um, one type of disk, okay. We're now in a, an environment where there are a plethora of processor choices, okay. Uh, my friends at BIOS IT were talking about uh, Intel and AMD today and OpenPower and AMD. Okay, four different process, uh, processor choices. We've talked about different memory types, 3D cross point uh, as represented by Optane, standard DDR, and other memory environments like the Diablo memory one that was referred to as well. Okay, and in terms of disk, we are really starting to see in anything but capacity disk, okay, uh, 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 SATA based SSD or NVMe really replacing all the uh, all the disk, uh, the high speed spinning rust and environment disappear. But we're also seeing a large number of different ways of deploying that underlying technology. And we're seeing a whole um, uh, raft of different choices in the acceleration environment. You know, we have NVIDIA, we have Intel, we have FPGAs, we have custom accelerators like the, uh, like the Google Tensor processing unit that uh, uh, was recently made public. What we see at Huawei is a disaggregation of these computing resources, very much in the way that uh, the earlier talk this morning on Arcuda was talking, where the idea is, is that all of those types of resources that are um, required are brought to bear in a computing solution on demand based on the nature of the environment and the workload that you're trying to put together. And this is probably best represented by this final one here. GPUs, FPGAs, A6, uh, traditional X86, uh, with a storage class memory potentially binding that all together. Okay, And again, we go from an environment that is uh, both efficient and agile on the uh, left of the screen uh, with low efficiency and ag agility to high on the right of the screen. That's how we see it evolving. And this is an example of this particular environment, the idea of using GPU pooling, NVMe pooling, smart orchestration, so that uh, you have a GPU pool, you have a storage pool, 
you have MVME over fabric, and what you do for a particular job that you have is you pull in via the fabric the GPUs or the storage that you require in order to be able to run the particular job on the framework that you have. Okay, so uh, you know the example a use case here is an, a, an image recognition use case, and the idea is that one could deliver video analysis uh, with on-demand high performance, uh, getting efficiencies of over 90%, as we saw the sort of numbers that we were seeing today in the Arcuda uh, presentation uh, from remote GPUs. And it's, uh, it's fairly interesting that the graph that we see here and the graphs that we saw earlier in the morning largely correlate. Okay. And I promised Sydney that I would get this through this uh, quickly and get us back on time. So I'll thank you for your time today. And if there are any questions, I'd be delighted to take them. Now, if you'd like to speak later one-on-one, -on -one, I'd also be only too happy to do that.